These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybelle is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Marybell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Marybell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Orhe, and in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again. He feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled-up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's… No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale. Deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um, we have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. 
After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like Coco? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me Coco. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orge had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well... Yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. 
That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Mary Bell was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there. A big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orge's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orge is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orge's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Mary Bell is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Mary Bell slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. 
Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off, yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually, but she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Marybell whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Marybell down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe... Marybell passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. There's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. 
As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a 10-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a 9-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have Level 4 security clearance and must have written permission and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. If you want to support Dr. Bob while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry, such as SCP-2119, Transmitting Parasite, for more perilous parasites. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.